friends and family, and welcome to my channel, Fundy Crimes, where we talk about true believers that commit true crime cases. While this is a true crime channel, we will also be discussing the religious doctrine that was indirect or direct cause to this case. Today's case, we are in my madhouse, which is the world of Jehovah's Witnesses. In particular, this case is about a family annihilator. And what makes the case very shocking is that a woman actually committed the crime. Her name was Lauren Stewart, and she committed familicide and murdered her husband and her two children. This case is very tragic. The details about Lauren's entire life is very thin because her family, I believe most of them are still Jehovah's Witnesses. So a lot of them didn't really go forward with too much detail about her upbringing, but she did have a lot of close friends that came forward and stood up for her after everything that happened. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Lauren and her husband, Daniel, and her two children, Stephen and Bethany. But for now, I want to get into the religious doctrine about Jehovah's Witnesses and how it was a cause to what happened and why Lauren did what she did. This case was very easy for me to research. Not so much about Lauren, but so much about, you know, disfellowshipping, which if you don't know, is essentially shunning or being excommunicated from the Jehovah's Witness world and the congregation and the organization. A lot of my family members were disfellowshipped at one point or another. So I called a lot of them and kind of asked about their input. And also, sadly, this case, we're going to talk about child sexual abuse as well. And unfortunately, it's very common in the Jehovah's Witness world. And I'll talk more about that a little later. So yeah, let's first, let's talk about the Jehovah's Witnesses and who they are. I also want to add in a quick note that when I do these cases, I try to be unbiased as possible, but it was kind of hard to be, it was kind of hard to be very unbiased with this because I think that it's my world and I know exactly how much damage it can be to be disfellowshipped. So with, throughout this video, I don't want it to be that I'm making excuses for Lauren whatsoever because what she did obviously was awful and a terrible act. But I see it more as an act of desperation, more so as an act of evil. Um, and also, a lot of times when I talk about Jehovah's Witnesses, I still say we and I don't say they. So if I say we, I apologize. It's just the way that I was raised. And I'm going to continue to say we because my whole life, it was my religion. And I owned it. And it was always, we do this, we do that, and we know the truth. So forgive me if I say we. I'm going to really try to continue to say they. But yeah, you can take the girl out of the hall, but you can't take the hall out of the girl. So let's talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. So Jehovah's Witnesses, you probably know them as like your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. You know, they knock on your door. They offer you a watchtower. They're always very friendly and understanding. They're never pushy. But, you know, behind the mask, I will say that Witnesses are more terrible to their own people than they are to the outside world. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses is a huge group and they're a worldwide membership of approximately 8.5 million members. And that's not even giving the numbers of their annual memorial, which is basically their Passover or their Easter, where 19.7 million members attend. And again, this is a worldwide religion. The World Jehovah's Witness organization started in 1870s in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it began as a Bible study group, and it was first founded by Charles Taze Russell. Um, and then eventually it switched over from Charles into the governing body of men which will to this still this day, all of the, the doctrine, like the Watchtowers, the Wake magazines, all the pamphlets are written by this organization of the governing body of men. It's so funny that I couldn't even tell you any of their names, but they obviously controlled my entire life. The group can range from a number of 18 to seven. I think right now there's currently seven men that are in charge, but it was said that, you know, these men are anointed by God and they are the mouthpiece from Jehovah to all the congregants. And it's even funny that their weekly talks, um, everything's outlined for the elders to give. So it's not like when, you know, you go to a Pentecostal church and, you know, they have the same faith that every pastor is kind of doing a different sermon. Everywhere in the entire world, they're hearing the exact same sermon. And it's outlined from exactly, it's outlined from exactly what to say, and what scripture to use. So these governed body members just have a very tight grip on the, organization. Jehovah's Witnesses don't even call where they go to a church. It's called a kingdom hall. They very much try to, you know, refrain from using the regular basic Christian words as church and, you know, pastor and stuff like that. It's very much its own little jargon. And I won't get too far into it because I don't want to confuse everyone. Um, so what do they basically believe? What I mean what they believe, this is just coming from me, what I was told my entire life, and people could correct me if I'm wrong. I was told basically that the world that we're living in is 
Satan's system of things and kind of like God had to step away, Jehovah had to step away, and you know, Jesus had to step away, and right now it's their world, and we know the truth. We had, I mean, they know the truth. They have the one, they have the one true Bible. This Bible has been around for a gazillion years, and King James Bible is completely wrong, and that it is the true religion, and they have to spread the good news, and they're gonna continue to preach about it until Armageddon happens. Armageddon happens, it's going to be really bad for all you non-witnesses and everyone else is going to be like resurrected. If you die before Armageddon, which many millions have, obviously they believe you don't go to heaven or hell and basically you just go to sleep and that when Jesus comes back on his horse and everything, then we will all, oh my God, I'm just, I'm just keep saying we, I'm so sorry. We will all be resurrected and then we will be able to live an everlasting paradise in an everlasting paradise there is like no sickness there is no crime it is basically just a perfect world we will have perfect healthy bodies and we will know no pain or no suffering for the rest of our lives and live forever and i was asked when i was a kid i remember being like what age are we gonna be if everyone's young like is my grandma gonna be my age and they just had no answer of course but besides the point that's why joe witnesses put a big emphasis on not sending your children to college and remember this for the case because they believe that sending your kid to college, we're not going to need doctors and lawyers in the new system in the new world, um, you know, in everlasting paradise. We're going to need, you know, plumbers. We're going to need electricians. We're going to need carpenters. We're going to need builders. We're going to need all the tradesmen. And going to college is kind of pointless because it's going to do no use to us. So college was very strongly discouraged. And they don't ever really say it outright, but they, lo they like say it in so many different ways. Joe Witnesses are famously known for not participating in anything worldly again because it's Satan's system of things. So they don't celebrate holidays. They don't like participate in elections. They don't, you know, encourage much fraternizing with people on the outside of the religion, even though it's not like you can't talk to someone that isn't Joe Witness, but most of the time they want you to kind of remain in the bubble. And if you, if you work for someone, let it be a witness. And Growing up, a lot of my family members like worked for other witnesses and getting outside jobs. Whenever they did get outside jobs, they worked with all witnesses around them. So even their boss was like, my mom's boss was Jewish, but everyone in the upstairs office was Jehovah Witness. So they kind of try to keep it very small, but at the same time, they're not as like culty, I can say, as other organizations that we talk about in this channel that they're like, oh, you can't talk to anyone. You're still allowed to have like friends and family that are on the outside, but really like What's the point if you're not going to see the nervous in paradise, right? I would say the two biggest things and two biggest reasons why there's strong criticism in the world of witnesses and something that I feel like, you know, is terrible. One thing they do is this fellowship. Um, guess fellowship is basically like when you do something that is either adultery, something that is against some of the religious doctrine, and I'll read exactly what the stipulations are and when it happened. You go in front of elders, they give you your papers and tell you this fellowship, and no one in the congregation is allowed to speak to you anymore whatsoever. And you basically have to like earn your way back into their congregation. I know I have family members where this took about five years. So keep that in mind that when they stop speaking to you, it's 100%. And I actually went on the Jehovah's Witness website, and um, the first thing that in their book, Keep Yourself in God's Love, Two factors which most coincide result in this fellowshipping of one of Jehovah's Witnesses. First, a baptized witness commits a serious sin. Second, he does not repent. So that's the two things about it. It's like they commit a serious sin. And again, the, major, the bigger sins I saw was really adultery or like partying or kind of like sinning and stuff like that. And they, if you didn't repent, then you'd be disfellowshipped. So the biggest thing we want to go by, though, is also they said, how should we treat a fellowship person? Bible says, stop keeping company with anyone called a brother who is sexually immoral or a greedy person or idolater or a violent or a drunkard or extortioner, not even eating with such a man. Regarding everyone who does not remain in teaching of the Christ, we read, do not receive him in your homes or say a greeting to him, for the one who says a greeting to him is a share in his wicked words. We do not have spiritual or social fellowship with fellowship ones. The Watchtower of September 15th of 1981, page 25, stated, a simple hello to someone can be the first step that develops into a conversation and maybe even a friendship. Would we want to take that first step with this fellowship person? Is strict avoidance really necessary? Yes, for several reasons. First is a matter of loyalty to God and his word. We obey Jehovah not only when it's convenient, but also when doing so presents real challenges. 
Love for God moves us to obey all his commandments. Recognizing this is just and loving as his law promotes the greatest good. Second, withdrawing from an unrepentant wrongdoer protects us and the rest of the congregation for spiritual and moral contamination and help hold the congregation's good name. Third, our firm stand for Bible's principles may even benefit this fellowship one. By supporting the decision of the Judicial Committee, we may touch the heart of a wrongdoer who thus far has failed to respond to the efforts of the elders to assist him. Losing precious fellowship with loved ones may help him to come to his senses, see the seriousness of his wrong, and take steps to return to Jehovah. So yeah, the disfellowshipping is very common. Again, like I mentioned earlier, I had many family members that were disfellowshipped. And the biggest takeaway from that, I remember when I was a kid and someone looked disfellowshipped, we were told you don't speak to them because it helps them. That basically we're drawing them closer to God by avoiding them. I think it's just so sad how isolated when, you know, everyone you know is a witness and then one day they completely isolate you, don't talk to you. And I mean, don't talk to you. It's like, don't make eye contact, like act like they're not there. And I would see them sit in the back of the kingdom hall by themselves and go to the lessons and try to get back into good standings. Um, because of this, a lot of times people that are disfellowshipped um, do commit suicide. And sadly, these numbers aren't fully reported. So a lot of the stories are coming forward. It's from other relatives telling their stories. But when someone commits suicide, you know, please, they're checking demographics as far as like gender and race. They're not checking what their religion is. So it's hard to really determine how many witnesses have committed suicide from being disfellowshipped. It was a number, though, that, you know, that the rate of suicides associated with the size, he seems to be five to ten times the rate of the general population. So, again, the exact number is not known, but a lot of times when people are disfellowshipped, suicide does happen, and it's very sad. I, you know, I just want to keep that in mind to explain kind of like the isolation is fellowshipping and how much it messes with someone psychologically to have the entire world cut you off and that you are a shameful person. The second major controversy with Jehovah's Witnesses is their sexual abuse numbers. It is unknown exactly how many children were sexually abused in the Jehovah's Witness world, but in the recent years, a lot of lawsuits have come forward of people telling their stories about how when they were abused as a child, they went to their elders and the Jehovah's Witnesses have a rule where it's called the two witness rule and the two witness rule basically is that if any witness stands a scripture if any witness stands against another witness there needs to be a second witness to they say hey verify this is true obviously many times if someone is sexually abused there's not going to be someone that's like yeah i saw it too and come forward so that was one thing is that it was always their word versus someone else's and when there was a second witness that came forward many times elders would tell them that they were lying and they would move these people to different congregations and move them around not tell anyone and the major major issue is that none of it was reported to police like i said they believe that the outside world is satan's world so the governing body is its own governing body they don't believe in elections they don't believe in government you know they pay taxes and follow the law but for the most part they don't believe in that authority so because of that all these cases of people that were sexually abused it's so heartbreaking when I hear these stories come forward. I'm always afraid to hear a family member say it, but I know of people personally that have been abused in the congregation and it's just very sad and there's so many stories. So why I bring up this fellowship and sexual abuse is all linked to exactly what Lauren Stewart went through growing up and when those two things are what made her ultimately snap and kill her family. So Lauren Stewart was born on January 9th, 1973. I don't know where she actually was raised, but at the time of this case, she was living in Kego Harbor, Michigan. Um, growing up, from what I was able to gather, Lauren was one of 11 children, and her mother died when she was around 13 or 12 years old. And according to her very close friend, Joyce, who we're going to talk a lot about her a lot later, she's awesome. Around the time after her mother died, she began to be sexually abused by a family member. There wasn't detail exactly of who that member was. But, you know, Lauren went through that, and that obviously probably was something that was terrible for her. So not much is known about the gap from her age 13 until she met her husband. Her husband's name was Daniel Stewart. I'm unsure if Daniel was a Jehovah's Witness himself, but I know Lauren was raised one. But, you know, throughout Lauren's childhood and, you know, even early adulthood, when she became a mother, she did suffer from depression. She had two children who we're going to talk about, her children's names for Stephen, who was born in 1990, and then her daughter, Bethany, who was born in 1994. 
for the most part, they seemed like a very loving and happy family. They were Jehovah's Witnesses and they were going to the congregation regularly and they were practicing, you know, and they, they were faithful. Daniel was described as being someone that was like extremely intelligent. He actually had a great job at the University of Michigan Center for Integrative Research and Critical Care. He was a data solutions architect. And again, everyone said that he was like freakishly smart, like very, very high IQ. And his son, Stephen, also was the same way where he also was very smart. See, their son, Stephen, excelled at computers. And their daughter, Bethany, was also very intelligent and great at graphic arts. So like I mentioned earlier in my long ramble, Joe Witnesses really don't encourage children going to college because they say that we don't need it in the new world when we go to everlasting paradise. However, it obviously is control tactic. I think that they discourage it, obviously, so that children don't become worldly. But they had two very smart kids and they didn't want their kids not going to college like they did. So they sent their kids to college. And when they did that, allegedly the organization and their congregation got very upset that they did this and they disfellowshipped Lauren. And Lauren was disfellowshipped and, you know, she was doing the right thing by her kids. So I think whenever you know you're right, you're able to remain firm and strong and say, you know what, I'm doing what's best for my children. It really is something that's very selfless to be like, you know what, I may lose everything in my family, but at least my kids will be pushed forward. So around this time, you know, after everything happened, it seemed like her family, like most of her siblings didn't really speak to her like that. I'm unsure it's because they were witnesses. Her father mentioned that like Daniel pulled her away from the family since the moment that they met and that her father never really cared for Daniel. Again, this is all unsure exactly what happened. So after her kids went to college and she was fellowship, she had a really hard time, you know, with everyone pulling away from her. But Lauren really tried to start having a new life. Lauren started to contact modeling agencies, photographers, see whether they wanted, you know, older models like herself. She became like a part-time personal trainer at the YMCA. And she also cleaned houses. She really was trying to get herself to have a normal life away from the congregation. She also posted online one time, I love acting and modeling. I'm a very passionate person who reflects my work. I'm adventurous in nature, and so I like a wide variety of acting and modeling experiences. I enjoy learning new things, especially with good direction. Life is an adventure, and my goal is to die knowing I did the things I wanted to do. So, so Lauren in the beginning was, you know, remaining very, like, trying to remain positive and Keep her head above water but slowly her family members start to notice something a little bit different about her that she started you know becoming a little depressed she started talking a lot more about like religious doctrine they weren't sure if it was mental illness or everything finally getting to her and you have to realize growing up Jehovah's Witness we are told since like day one about how Armageddon is going to come like a, a thief in the night and it makes it makes you very anxious like they're oh we're always told that like we have to be vigilant we have to be careful we have to like always like be vigilant with our faith because any moment the world can end i still have anxiety from that and i still have fears that maybe i'm not doing the right thing and maybe that one day you know our is going to come and there's this passage i think it was in the watchtower where it talks about that the people that are basically apostates that were former members are the ones that are going to be the most damned as opposed to those that didn't know the truth so that kind of builds in your mind if for you know for 40 years you're hearing this all the time. So again, Lauren and Daniel were 47 years old at the time. Their son Stephen was 27 and their daughter Bethany was 24. Bethany was still living at home, but Stephen was not. So as Lauren was kind of like seeming very off to close friends and really going on religious rants, I think no one really took it as seriously and she was not on any type of medication or was getting any type of external help. So we're going to talk about the crime that happened to today. The weeks before we get into today's case, um, Lauren was up searching suicide methods on YouTube and she watched videos on how to use a Glock handgun. So on February 6, 2018 at 11 p.m., Lauren recorded a two minute video of herself explaining that she was gonna commit suicide and it had nothing to do with her family and that you know she had many issues and that she couldn't do it anymore and that she didn't wanna be a burden to her family. On February 7th, the next day, around 1 p.m., she recorded another video about her path of destruction, talked about her childhood sexual abuse, and 
tell, explaining that it drove her to want to commit suicide. The day before, on February 14th, Lauren, you know, reached out to her son, Stephen, and was kind of like, oh, come over for Valentine's Day. Again, this family was very close. So Lauren, obviously, this was very, very, very premeditated. On February 15th, she sent her husband's boss text message that said, Mark, this is Lauren. Dan had an accident this morning and has died. I can't talk now. Phone will inform you later on the details at hospital. The boss, you know, obviously text, text back for more information and Lauren did not respond. The same day later on, Lauren texts her cousin and she said this, I hate to tell you I failed my test with God to submit to him. I stumbled on the free love from God. I wanted his love, but not if I had to belong completely to him. I made a selfish heart by doing for me instead of God. I hardened my heart and lied to myself that love from God isn't real. I'm ashamed of the that I became I become evil. I took my husband and kids with me so they don't have to feel my selfish act. They will sleep till Christ. I truly hope you do better where I failed. And this is the last communication she ever made with anybody. And her cousin immediately freaked out and went over to her house. And that is when police were called and they discovered what the scene was. And it's unclear exactly the order of the deaths, but her daughter Bethany was sadly found on her bed where she was shot in the head with um, a pillow covering her, most likely to silence it. Her son Stephen was found face down on the spare bedroom floor and was believed to have been shot twice in the head while sitting in a chair when he fell. Her husband Dan was found in the basement in front of the couch with a gunshot wound to his head. His right hand was in his front pocket, suggesting that he tried to react when he was shot. And then Lauren herself was found at the base of the stairs with a pistol next to her. She shot herself between the eyes after having to look up the method online. She also killed the family dog, so it was on a complete family annihilation. You know, clearly this was very methodical and thought out. And in her suicide note, um, some parts that I was able to find, it said, I allowed evil into my heart. And I chose not to accept God's free love, and it made me sick inside. I killed my family because I know my death would stumble them. At least now they will not suffer and be resurrected into love forever in peace. Remember, they believe about like resurrection and that she believed, I think what she believed was that, you know, by doing this, she won't go to paradise, but at least her kids will. And I think Lauren in her, you know, mind that seemed very sick, she thought because they weren't living the Jehovah's Witness world by killing them, it gives them more of a chance than the life that she started them on, the path she put them on, which was putting them in college. And I don't know were her regrets for 100% religion or if it was a mixture of mental illness. I just know that her suicide note from what I was able to find had a lot of religious whole witness doctrine. And reading as a former Jehovah's Witness, the letter made sense, but to the outside world probably was like, what is she talking about resurrection? So yeah, that was a lot. I'm taking a pause. I'm, I'm sorry if I sounded very like dry as I was reading it. I just think, you know, I'm a mom and I just... You know, I'm trying to not put my head too much in it, and I'm also a former witness. So I'm trying not to cry reading about this because I think what her children went through and her husband went through is just absolutely awful. Sorry, try not to get emotional. I think her kids deserved a chance to have a life, and it's just so sad. Their lives are cut off at 24 and 27. And, you know, it's hard for me. I'm upset with her, you know, reading about this. And at the same time, though, I'm understanding the madness where it's kind of like, you know, this fellowship people, when we outside world reads this case immediately, you probably think to yourselves like, oh, this woman's psycho and she was evil. You know, I hope she burns in hell. But for me, it's kind of like almost a cautionary tale where it's like they have to reconsider the practices of fellowshipping. I know it's in the Bible, but they have to reconsider the lengths they go to and how much isolation and how they don't check in with the people that are fellowship, that they don't have like an elder or a brother that is required to be like, hey, do a monthly check-in, see how these people are doing, and they want to come back and make sure their mental health is okay. I think it's clearly isolating them and giving someone this silent treatment is not ever going to work. And, you know, talking to family members of his fellowship and, you know, in the past two weeks and hearing, like, the pain they went through and being avoided by their parents or their siblings, and it's just really, like, heartbreaking. And I'm trying, again, not to get emotional, but I'm just explaining why I read all the details of the case so dry. I don't want anyone to think my true crime channels that when I talk about these crimes that they're just like, oh, shot our kids. Who cares? Like, I care. Um, it's just I'm trying to not think too much about the step-by-step -step process. So, yeah. So, 
And this is the most I think I ever ranted in the video, not get straight to the facts. So after that happened, um, I mentioned that her very close friend, her name was Joyce Taylor. And after this happened, she actually went to the congregation and confronted the elders and the entire congregation about what happened. I'm going to play the clip here. I can watch that clip every day for the rest of my life and just like die happy. Excuse me, everyone. My name is Joyce Taylor. Please excuse the intrusion. I'll only be a moment. No, you cannot touch me. You cannot touch me. Two days excuse ago. Me. Two days ago. You're away from me. No. Two days ago. You called. Please do. Two days ago, Dan and Lois Stewart died. Four people died as a result of your shunning process. Can we go in the back? No. Five years ago, all of you pulled your support from this small family. From this small family. Please get down. And you all do not touch me. Do not touch me. The only support they ever had was you people. And you turned your, you turned them away and you shunned them. For what? Because they wanted to raise their children and they saw fit. Jesus said, the police are on the way. that you did this to Elisa Wine, you did it to me. Let that sink in. Do any of you realize just how fragile the human psyche is? I hope in your prayers today, you will find that in your heart, ask forgiveness for for what you guys did. This is terrible. Do not touch me. Thank you, everyone. And I don't think people realize how badass Joyce was for doing that. And Joyce also afterwards came forward and she explained a lot of like Lauren's mindset because when the headlines first happened, it was just like, this is a family annihilator. It's a beautiful woman who killed her beautiful children and her successful handsome husband and everyone was just shocked and didn't understand so um joyce was kind of like that spokesperson that went around and really made sure to explain the psychological damage that lauren went through and also explaining like you know her childhood trauma and kind of giving a bigger picture of exactly how this happened um so yeah i think that's just an amazing friend to continue to you know give out that support even after your friend did something terrible and to understand where they came from um there really wasn't much afterwards you know they spoke to the press spoke to some family members like i said her dad and her sisters they seemed like they still had a you know they were like we haven't spoken to her in six years we haven't spoken to her in five years so it kind of explains that lauren really was isolated from her family again i understand her family's faith so i don't want to have this to be like a video bash them of how dare they i get why people don't talk to fellowship people because you actually think you are helping them and I believe that for like most of my life and I get it now how awful it truly is. Um, yeah, so that is the case. I think I rambled more in this video than I ever have in any other video. Usually I try to get straight to the facts and then give my opinion at the end. But this is why I was avoiding the Jehovah's Witness case and it's hard for me to kind of criticize them so openly because I still have a lot of family members that are part of the organization and I love them a lot and I don't agree with their beliefs, but it doesn't mean I don't love them. I don't think that they're bad people. I just think that I was given the opportunity because my, like I mentioned in previous videos, my parents were really shitty witnesses, so they didn't follow the rules all the way. So I was able to have more opportunities into the outside world and go to college and was able to get another perspective. And a lot of my family members didn't. So I'm saying all these things, you know, and it's coming from like a high horse kind of in a sense. And I don't want People misconstrued that like I hate witnesses. I don't. I just disagree and I don't believe in their beliefs. And I disagree with a lot of things that they do. Um, there's so many different type of witnesses. I think that, you know, we see like conservative Christians, like the IFB, stuff like that. It's like there's only one type. You're either in or you're out. The thing with witnesses, it's like there's so many different types. There's people that are like the, that are fully in, that go to every single meeting, that go door to door. They're like the pioneers. They're like very serious. There's also witnesses that are like, Kind of one foot out the door that believe but they're sick of all the work that's involved and they kind of like avoid going but they go to like memorial and stuff like that there's also the ones that are like completely out but they can't renounce what they believe they can't renounce the faith because they'll lose everyone and 
it's sad that they're like so trapped and if anyone's watching this that is a former witness or someone that wants to leave just take your time like I know I come from a place where again I was fortunate where my parents like I was exposed to the outside world and I had a lot of friends and I had a lot of family my mom's entire family was not witnesses so I had plenty of places to go so it's like kind of like leaving an abusive relationship they say take your time don't leave right away it's more dangerous it's like take your time and talk to people that are on the outside but don't feel pressured to have to like just put both feet out the door and run away just take it easy make sure it's right for you um i would love one day to like do a video where i sit down and talk to like my dad who was this fellowship before and like other close relatives and have them share their stories because it's i don't know it's like when I talk to them, it's like some of them, it felt like it was like a break from it and they were able to have a normal life and others, it was just like the worst moment of their entire lives and that they felt like they had nothing and they're still, they're in fellowship. Like I'm not exaggerating, 40 years ago or 30 years ago and they still feel the trauma from it and they're still, they're still trying to heal. And yeah, it's, again, I'm ranting and I just want to tell everyone to hang in there. Um, if you are struggling, I'm going to put resource at the end where you can reach out. Like, I know you feel like you're alone. And for the most part, yeah, right now you are alone, but there is a world out there that's going to love you and take care of you. Don't feel like you don't have people to reach out to. And if you're feeling that way, I'm truly sorry. Try not to cry. Again, try not to get emotional, but this case makes me very emotional because Lauren was desperate. And her kids and her husband had to suffer. And I'm just so sad for them that they aren't here right now. And, you know, I just, it sucked. But, yeah. You guys, too many questions for me about my life as a former witness. You know, please comment below. Please subscribe. It really does help the channel. I'm trying to, like, build this up. Maybe get a little monetized. That'd be awesome. But if not, just, you know, still comment below. I'll post it on the Funny Snark subreddit. I think I'll try to also post it. I think there's an XJ-Dub subreddit. I'd love to hear from XJ-Dub members how they feel about this case where they're feeling how I'm feeling where it's like where I'm so biased because I feel so bad for Lauren. At the same time, I'm so angry at her for what she did. So yeah, thanks for letting me rant about former Joe Witnesses. And I'm sorry that this was less, you know, reporting and more ranting and whining. So yeah, and I'm also very easily, I got sick again story of my life but thank you everyone for watching and supporting love you i mean it have a great day